Welcome to the Evolution Show. I'm Johan Landgren. In the previous episode, we had a really cool guest on the show to help us navigate the world of artificial intelligence and explain why we may be on the brink of an AI revolution that may happen within only decades. This means we need to take the AI risks much more serious to avoid existential threats to humanity. Today, Professor Ulle Hegström is back. And together, we talk about how we can prepare for the AI revolution to make it safe and the best thing humanity has ever created, instead of the potentially worst. So stick around, you don't want to miss this episode. And if you like the content and you want to support the show, we really appreciate a thumbs up and consider subscribing. As always, stay ahead of the curve and stay electric. This is The Evolution Show. Welcome back, Professor Ulle Hegström. Thank you. You are one of the leaders in the AI field in Sweden, and you're a professor in statistical mathematics at Chalmers Technical University in, here in Sweden. And in the previous episode, we talked about why we need to take the risks associated with increased AI use much more serious than we do today. And we talked about more openly and how we have to talk about it more in a transparent way and follow the, the AI research as it develops towards what can be artificial, become artificial general intelligence and super AI. And today we're going to talk about how we can make this transition to artificial general intelligence and artificial super intelligence safe and for her, hopefully fantastic for the humanity and even our solar system. And uh, if you don't know about artificial general intelligence and what artificial AI is, um, intelligence is, I really encourage to check out our first episode when we talk about what it is, algorithms, machine learning, and so on. Okay, but today let's focus on, on what's called in AI research and in your fantastic book, Thinking Machines, that just came out, or Tänkande Maschiner in Swedish, what's called AI alignment, how to make AI technology non-harmful and to humans and of course other life on this planet, how to prepare for AGI, artificial general intelligence and artificial superintelligence that might be developed in the next decades. So in your book, Thinking Machines or Tänkande Maschiner, you talk about different strategies, how we can adopt, uh, how we can adopt these strategies and increase the likelihood that we have a positive outcome for artificial general intelligence and super AI. So, Ulle, what alignment do you see as a key and why is it important to prepare for this in advance? I think a good idea here uh, could be to go back to a statement uh, made by Alan Turing uh, even a few years uh, before uh, the AI uh, research was uh, officially began in a conference in 1956. Uh, Alan Turing died tragically a couple of years earlier in 1954. But in 1951, he uh, has this uh, paper where he uh, outlines some visions for, for uh, the future of, of uh, uh, computers and artificial intelligence. And, and he uh, sketches many ideas that weren't taken very seriously until uh, half, a, half a century later, uh, including the idea that once, he talks about once the machine thinking method gets started, it can start rolling uh, on its own. The machines can start improving themselves without further help uh, from humans. And he says that uh, they can become incredibly much uh, smarter uh, than, than we are. And so therefore, at some stage, we should have to expect the machines to take control. So that's a very ominous uh, statement. Uh, but as I said, it, it was mostly ignored. But uh, when people start thinking about it again, uh, there's just one small step from what Alan Turing says here to the realization that Okay, 
if we cannot count on uh, remaining in control ourselves, but this control will be taken over, taken over by machines, uh, then everything will hinge on what the machines are motivated to do. Uh, so uh, this calls attention to, to the crucial question here of, of what we call AI alignment, which is aligning the goals and values of the uh, first superintelligent machine with uh, whatever it is uh, we would like them to uh, strive for. And typically, this is uh, associated with the goal of, of creating human flourishing and so on. But it's very unclear actually what that means. And, and we can probably talk uh, a mm -hmm. bit more yeah. about that. Mm -hmm. but, but this is something that we absolutely have to do before uh, the super intelligent machine is up and running. Because mm -hmm. once it is up and running, we talked in, in the previous episode about uh, our inability to pull the plug on such a machine. Mm -hmm. And we will, for similar reasons, be probably be unable to modify its goals uh, once it is up and running. Mm. Because once it has its goals, it's going to strive for this and it's not going to allow us to, to uh, tamper with it. I just uh, thought about what you wrote in your book and, and you mentioned Nick, Nick Bostrom in a segment, I think that uh, you, can, you could pr uh, probably and hopefully create conditions for the AI uh, that will be beneficial to the AI and to the humans at the same time. That, for, for example, that you create an, a, a situation where the AI feels that it's good for it uh, to um, improve the, the life and the, um, uh, the happiness and so on for the humans. And the more it, it uh, and, and it also, it's sort of, it's not an end game that if you reach this uh, level, everything is, the ultimatum is, you know, fix the faces, as you said, with smiles, but more like a continuous um, interaction with the humans that, okay, this, uh, the humans reacted positive to this. Okay, maybe I should try this. Oh, this was also good. Or this was not so good. I will take a step back and I will not do that. Just like we are having a discussion, I, I see on you that uh, you, you you're smiling when I say this, and you you're not so you're 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 feeling you know um, really bad, and I I, I really uh, are disrespectful if I say this. You know this this continuous interaction that we always have to have, uh, but of course at a bigger at a higher level uh, when we talk about the super AI is is that a way forward. Yes, let me first just comment on this notion that you mentioned of what, what is good for the AI. <laughs> and I think that uh, we shouldn't be naive about that concept. Uh, and, and what is good for the AI is actually entirely dependent on what is the AI's goals. Mm -hmm. and, and if the uh, AI is programmed to maximize paperclip production, to cite a, a popular example that I talk quite a bit about uh, in the book. Then uh, what is good for the AI is, is precisely uh, maximal uh, paperclip uh, production. Uh, and, uh, and the AI will strive for whatever is good for the AI. This, this concept that you describe uh, of, of uh, a, a gradual uh, adaptive uh, learning of uh, human values uh, on the part of the AI, this is uh, a suggestion by um, uh, computer scientist uh, Stuart Russell at uh, Berkeley, uh, who has worked on, a lot on the AI alignment problem. And like other researchers in, in the field, he is pessimistic about the idea of uh, setting up a list of concrete goals for the machine to achieve. Uh, that would most likely lead to uh, perverted instantiations that we uh, talked about uh, last time. Uh, I want to mention the most famous example of, of, of such a list of, of concrete goals, and that is um, Isaac Asimov's three laws of robotics, where the first law is uh, that uh, a machine can never hurt a human. The second law is that the machine should obey humans as long as it doesn't conflict with the first law. And the third law is that it should protect itself as long as that does not come in conflict with the first and the second laws. Well, 
actually the third law here turns out to be um, superfluous uh, because uh, uh, the, with a theory of, of AI goals and, and motivations that has been developed by people like Nick Bostrom and uh, Steve Mohandro and Elsie Yudkowsky, uh, this is one of the goals that the machine is likely to pick up automatically. It needs to protect itself in order to work for its uh, ultimate goal, whatever that is, and no matter what this ultimate goal is. Okay, anyway, we know from, from, from the robot stories uh, by Isaac Asimov that these laws, I mean, the whole point of his science fiction stories is typically that, that uh, these robot laws lead to strange and unexpected outcomes. Uh, if, if, if the first law has priority, which it has, that to protect humans and make sure that no human comes to harm, then a natural conclusion for the machine is to uh, lock up all humans in, in rooms where all the edges and walls have been covered with, in soft stuff so that it's not possible for, for a human to hurt himself inside this room. And this is another case of what we really don't want the machines to do, but which can easily become a consequence if we have this rule-based uh, approach. And, and uh, basically, Everything we know about AI alignment, the way it has developed over the past decade or a, a little bit more, is that no matter how you set up such a list of concrete rules, there is going to be uh, a great risk of uh, perverted instantiation in one way or another. So this is not considered viable. We need some indirect way. And what um, Stuart Russell proposes is, is simplifying somewhat, it's, it's that the machines should look at what humans are doing and how humans are acting and infer from that what it is we want. Okay. Uh, and uh, pick up and, and work towards those goals. Mm. And it's important here that the uh, machine is uh, uncertain about uh, what these goals are because once it attains certainty, we're basically in, in, in the situation I just described with, with fixed, uh, fixed rules uh, for what to do. Mm. And, and, and that typically goes uh, to work in one way or another. Uh, you know, the example of paper clips is often mentioned uh, in the AI research um, that of this pervasive instant instantization that can happen. Um, for just for people to understand, could you take this example uh, and uh, uh, to show that you know the, the intentions uh, might be good and uh, and so on, but it may end up uh, in no space at all on this planet. It's a thought experiment. Yeah, and it goes like this: uh, we have this highly automated uh, paperclip factory, uh, where automation has been taken a step further than even the most automated factories today. So that we have this one AI that runs the production and also takes over more and more of the administration. And the only humans working there are the AI engineers trying to optimize this AI even further. It has the goal of maximizing paperclip production, which on certain scales, if you run a paperclip factory is a very, very sensible goal. But at one point, more or less by accident, uh, the um, AI engineers uh, push this machine over the critical threshold uh, for fast recursive self-improvement. And then the AI takes off on its own self-improvement trajectory. And very quickly, it attains super intelligence uh, levels. And it uh, does all the things that we expect such a machine uh, to do, uh, making copies uh, of itself, backup copies uh, all over the internet and so on, and starts working towards this goal, which is still the goal of maximizing uh, paperclip production. Mm. And as long as the scale is just one factor, this, this, this makes sense. But once you have a, a, a super intelligent machine that can outsmart us in all sorts of ways, maximizing paperclip production is a fatal goal because uh, really maximizing it is taking everything and turning into paperclips, including ourselves. Uh, the entire planet. So, so what happens 
I mean, I could fill in some details, but, but if we fast forward, uh, we'll have a, a planet consisting entirely of a giant heap of uh, paper clips, except possibly for some rocket launch stations and stuff like that for the machine to go on and turn the rest of the solar system and the rest of the Milky Way and the rest of the observable universe mm. into paper clips. Mm. We don't want this to happen. No. People react to this by saying, oh, but that's, that can't really happen, uh, can it? That's a, such a stupid idea to turn everything into paper clips. But th that objection uh, misunderstands the uh, orthogonality, as, as we talk about it, the orthogonality between intelligence and goals. Intelligence is not to have a particular goal. It, intelligence is, is the ability to efficiently uh, achieve whatever goal it is you have. Mm. Uh, and and uh, uh, one point of, of choosing uh, paper clips in this example is that it's such a seemingly innocent uh, goal. It has nothing to do with military applications and so on. So at first one would think that this is harmless, but almost any goal uh, can be uh, uh, highly harmful uh, unless you, you're able to uh, suitably restrain it. And uh, I would like to move on to, to talk about uh, how we can uh, use AI or be uh, guided by AI or more or less interface, have a human to AI interface. Uh, because Elon Musk, like you, uh, he have been long, he still is, but he has long been a proponent of creating a regulating entity to monitor and limit uh, the harmful use of AI, for example, for autom automated weapon systems with AI, for example, um, and to make it likely, create the conditions like we talked about for a uh, positive outcome for humanity and life as we know it, uh, as we come close to uh, artificial general intelligence or super AI. But he has come to the conclusion that very few listen to him, uh, very few politician, decision maker, other leading companies and so on, uh, they're going full throttle ahead with uh, using new AI tools, no questions asked. And for that reason, that's one of the reasons he created this company called Neuralink, uh, where he wants to create this interface between humans. Eventually, first, it's going to be to help uh, people with disabilities, for example, uh, to improve our ways of communicating with, between humans. But eventually he wants, he thinks that if you can't beat them, join them, is, is, is uh, um, quoted from, of, of saying. But he's still like, you're very serious about the threat, but he's come to the conclusion that people don't understand this, that there are people that really have to understand it. They, they just skip the, the safety part of AI. So what do you think? Is it possible to sort of create a bridge between uh, now and then, sort of, you know, improving our um, cognitive abilities, our ways of, as he said, not using our thumbs. And, you know, uh, when I want to communicate with you, I have to say it with my mouth. I could perhaps just send you the information with my, with my brain, electrically, uh, electronically. Uh, I mean, this, this kind of uh, interface uh, or transition uh, way of approaching this. Uh, what do you think about this? Yeah, so... so uh, these advanced uh, uh, machine brain interfaces is part of a broader development, uh, which is the transhumanistic uh, modification of, of, of the human body and, and uh, human nature. And other parts of this are, are more into pharmacological treatments or, or um, uh, genetic uh, uh, changes to our uh, genetic makeup and so on. And I, I, I think that uh, this is, uh, these are ideas are all very interesting. Uh, I'm very agnostic about what we should do uh, because uh, all these developments uh, are, are, have um, potential uh, downsides. Uh, and we talked uh, before in the last episode about uh, arms races uh, and, and, and that's, uh, uh, very much uh, in store for us if we pursue uh, transhumanistic uh, human enhancement uh, uninhibitedly. Uh, we can get situations on the labor market, for instance, 
where, well, let's take me as an example. I'm a mathematician. Suppose that, that Elon, Musk, uh, Elon Musk develops some sort of um, electronic add-on to the uh, human brain that uh, vastly enhances uh, our mathematical abilities. It just has this uh, side effect that it causes constant anguish. That would be the worst possible situation for me uh, as a mathematician, because I would have to choose between either accepting this uh, device uh, and becoming a successful mathematician uh, um, at the cost of, of uh, having this uh, terrible side effect, uh, or being just outcompeted and knocked out uh, of the mathematics circuit because uh, all my uh, uh, competitors who, who pick up on this device uh, will, will uh, use it. Uh, so, so, so that's an extreme scenario, but uh, there are all, all, all kinds of, of risks uh, uh, of this kind. And uh, we, we can uh, imagine situations uh, where genetic engineering has progressed to a, a stage where uh, if you are to become a parent, you can engineer the, the genome uh, of the child uh, to guarantee an IQ of, let's say, 180. Now, if you are of a more bioconservative leaning, you want, might want to have children in a more natural way without genetic intervention. But to uh, give birth to a child with IQ 100 in a world where all its classmates uh, are going to have IQ 180 is to put this child in a very difficult situation. So we can easily stumble into these kinds of situations where even if people formally have the freedom to pick up on, on, on the new technology or not, uh, it will put them in, in, in a, a very difficult situation uh, if they don't pick up on it. All these technologies, we need to think very, very carefully about whether to pursue them or not. Now, one aspect in thinking about this could be the kind of thing that Elon Musk suggests and, and uh, which uh, Stephen Hawking also suggested that there's a race here against the machines and we have to, we cannot rely on uh, the very, very slow workings uh, of biological evolution uh, if we are to keep up uh, as humans uh, in the race uh, against the machines. Uh, but uh, I'm not at all sure uh, that uh, that's the right uh, way forward. No. Yeah, there could be other ways of uh, having the machines uh, working in our favor rather than merging it. Uh, like mm. There could be more mm. subtle ways to do it. Oh, obvious question. If anyone hears discussion about human to AI interface, uh, people might think, yeah, yeah, that's a great tool for manipulation or someone could misuse this. And how about someone, you know, uh, you know, creating havoc in your brain or, uh, you know, taking control potentially, or at least manipulating uh, you into doing stuff. Uh, also, also, military applications yes. are, are obvious in this field. Uh, in recent years, I've known that it's been fantastic um, an AI that uh, made this uh, diagnosis uh, in a rare type of oh, leukemia. Lacumia, yes, uh, in Japan that couldn't otherwise been treated. And that's because an AI was analyzing this huge amount of data, this huge amount of journals going through them and finding, okay, yeah, this is a very rare type and we can do this and this. Um, so that was, I mean, there are fantastic ways we could approach this if we, if we, if it's developed in the right way. So I, I don't want people to think that uh, we're just negative here. <laughs> On the contrary, we're just trying to be you know, realistic and, uh, and balanced in, in our approach. So, but then of course, we have to talk about the labor market or the economy, because right now uh, we could call it automation, uh, you know, continuously using robots or machines or advanced software uh, that are step-by-step uh, -step replacing workers. And there is a debate right now, of course, on the other, on the one side you have um, primarily uh, economists saying that, yeah, we have seen, you know, different steps of improvements in history and it has resulted in new uh, types of work. So uh, 
if of course the people will be replaced but they will be replaced by new uh, types of works and uh, it, it it will be basically maybe 50 50 or even positive for the uh, you know uh, in terms of adding new uh, workers to the market and from the ones that were replacing them but on the other hand i would argue that uh, yes, but maybe if you're in your 50s, late, early 60s, uh, and you're being replaced uh, by this new technology, how are you going to be uh, reschooled and, uh, you know, be able to take this new work? Uh, you, you will still be out of work. So you will have a lot of people uh, without an income. And the current e economy is based on growth. And growth, uh, I, I wrote a book about this, uh, it's basically based on fossil consumption uh, that's been has enabled our can economy to grow as it has the last 200 years. And uh, as we continue, uh, we, if we're not growing with uh, people having enough income, if you have a decreasing labor uh, income market uh, or a labor market, uh, people won't be able to buy the products that the economy is producing. And Marx, uh, Karl Marx will, of course, say that this is the you know, classic example of a collapse of, of the capitalistic system. I would just say that it's a logically a consequence of us uh, you know, going 100% autonomous or 100% AI would inf could, in fact, result in the collapse of the system, depending on uh, how fast it would happen, obviously. Because if you can't produce and sell anything and there is no buyers... If you can overproduce, but you cannot buy it, <laughs> people don't have an income for it. What, what's, what's the point of having th this production? Uh, what's the point of having ownership, uh, you could say? So we have to address the question of um, continuous automation and, uh, and continuous development towards AI. How would this affect the labor market? This is a big question, I know, but I want us to, to a little bit talk about it because we have to address this question. So the first thing I want to say about this is that uh, uh, in relation to the earlier discussion we had about uh, artificial superintelligence, I think about these labor market issues as being about what will happen uh, in a closer time perspective before we hit the, the superintelligence uh, breakthrough. And um, Elsie Yudkovsky was one of the leading researchers in this field. He, he has a famous line about this, saying that, okay, you may ask uh, what, uh, what effect superintelligence will have uh, on the labor market. Uh, and the answer is that uh, this is like asking, what, what happens if the moon crashes uh, into the earth in terms of US-China relations? Of course, it would have a huge effect on US-China relations, but even asking this question misunderstands the, the, the magnitude of the, the kind of things that will happen. So, so once we have superintelligence in place, I, I think that we can basically forget about uh, uh, everything in terms of the, the labor market as we now know it. But let's think about this more gradual process yes. where artificial intelligence causes more and more automation. And the, the concerns you raise, uh, I think uh, they are real. Uh, now there are economists who say that uh, the, uh, uh, the loss of, of supply and demand uh, is, is going to, uh, in the long run, maintain unemployment levels at, uh, at, at, at normal levels, because uh, as, uh, uh, as AI advances in some fields, there are always going to be fields where humans are uh, relatively better than in these fields. We may not be uh, uh, better than the AIs themselves, but this would, there would still be an incentive to have humans uh, working uh, in these fields uh, where, where our relative position is the best compa compared to other fields. Uh, I don't think that that's a, a very uh, convincing argument why everything would be all right, because uh, salary levels uh, would be affected. And uh, the more uh, that uh, 
uh, AI outcompetes humans in field after field, the more will it uh, push down the competitive salary that uh, that a human uh, can ask for. Uh, yes. Yes, and I just wanted to add a, th a thing to the to the soup, so to speak. I mean, uh, we this gradual process you're talking about it's happening mm -hmm. before artificial general AI, mm -hmm. and I totally agree. That's what that's my what I wanted to to raise that point, and you you answered it. But I just uh, thought also that people must understand that this gradual process would mean that the redistribution of wealth would be extreme. So if yes. you think someone is super rich like Elon Musk today, he will be a picnic compared to what, uh, you know, a few one or two percent of the, if, if not even that, mm -hmm. 0 0.00% 0 .00 of the population will have 99.999% of the wealth. Yeah. Um, because they are in control, if they are, before the AI, artificial general intelligence developed, they are in control of uh, this super tool, this super AI tool um, that will be, has such a big effect on, yeah, they, they will basically produce everything. They will own the produ production of everything. Uh, and that transition from now to the future in 10, 15, 20 years is the big challenge as I see it. Uh, and that. How do we make that peacefully and without social yeah. injustice and make it fair? Yes. And one perspective on this, which I don't think I say so much about in the book, but it's this, that much of what happens in society uh, uh, is uh, affected by the power balance between elites uh, and the masses. And, and throughout the history, the elites... Uh, th there have been limits to what they can do because uh, they still need the masses to do all the work. Uh, but if we move towards a situation where the uh, masses uh, become unnecessary, I mean, the scenario almost speaks for itself that it's, uh, it might turn out to become incredibly uh, dangerous, mm. both for the masses and, and for the elite. Yeah. So and, and that's that's economy side. And if we just talk yeah. about in terms of decision making, in, in terms of democracy, mm. I mean, if we want to maintain a kind of um, engagement we have today, at least to a certain level, uh, if we want to be an, able to affect the decisions that will actually ultimately decide our future, uh, would we like to have them being decided for us by a super AI or uh, Taking a step back again, a, a, a small group of people before we reach that level, before, far before we come to even a, a artificial general intelligence, a very few people will have control of this uh, decision-making machine. Or concretely, powerful. concretely yeah. we can think about uh, the leaders of Google and Facebook uh, and uh, the corresponding co uh, companies in China mm. uh, could reach a, a totally disproportionate uh, amount of power due to them controlling the entire AI uh, infrastructure that uh, we all become increasingly reliant yeah. on. Yeah. So how do we go about this? I mean, th some people talk about, yeah, we need to have an international organization that monitor the, mm. the, the research, the, the different step towards uh, the progress of um, AI development. Uh, but if you think about it, why would other companies, you know, um, reveal their their you know company secrets uh, and be open about this uh, if they if they suspect that the other there is some other company out there that won't do that that would just go ahead mm -hmm. and, and race towards this super ai so it, for me it's it's kind of I, I would like to see this and i think many like you and ai and elon musk and others wants to see this uh, uh, international organization but is it realistic <laughs> to expect that they will be able to to, to do this that we want, to monitor this and to make this, to create this balance. Yeah, so we should figure out how to make this realistic. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's not uh, realistic to, to uh, put uh, uh, this uh, organization uh, in place uh, uh, this year in 2021. No. But, but maybe if we prepare it uh, 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 cleverly, yeah. we can make it realistic in 2025. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And exactly how to do this, I mean, my book is better at raising problems and asking questions uh, than at uh, providing uh, detailed solutions uh, of uh, how to do this. Yeah. 
uh, but I, I think that there's a, uh, the power balance between states uh, and large companies is uh, still at this point, I hope, somewhat in the favor of states. The US government uh, still has, has uh, um, power if they want to uh, use it uh, over uh, the major tech companies. Mm. Uh, but this uh, this power balance is gradually shifting, so we shouldn't uh, sit around uh, and uh, wait because uh, at some point uh, it yeah. might be too late. Yeah. And I, yeah, I, and just as a totally side note, I mean, uh, when I think about super AI and uh, so on, I, I couldn't help but thinking about bees because uh, I'm a beekeeper since about seven years, and. Uh, Beehives, they, they, they live in a community that's often described as a superorganism because they, they, are, they have a collective decision making that is subconscious, basically. It's not subconsciously, they, are, they have obviously ways to communicate, but it's, it's a super fantastic and inspiring um, in, in complex society. And what's interesting, what we can learn from, from the superorganisms like a beehive is that. Uh, their ultimate goal or their continuous goal, you could say, is to survive and to survive as a species. And they have done so for 50 million years. And part of that is because they don't focus so much on the individual in the, org uh, in the society. I mean, if even the bee, bee queen, if she is not producing enough uh, bees or if she is injured and so on, she won't be able to produce as many bees, th she, they will actually kill her. Uh, which is harsh, <laughs> harsh reality, but it's something to learn from that uh, they, they have a collective uh, intelligence that is fantastic because it's that what can learn from that is the way they communicate with each other. That I think a lot of uh, challenges we have today in the, in the world is because we are not communicating uh, in, uh, enough with each other. We don't understand each other. We're basically on different wavelengths and we have uh, different um, levels of uh, knowledge. But if we have an AI that is working in the way that you and I hope it will, perhaps it could be an, an helpful for us uh, to communicate in a way that uh, reaches a level of uh, consciousness that is more sort of a collective uh, way of um, approaching problems and understanding problems. Uh, well, I mean, this is very abstract, obviously, but uh, what do you think about this? Uh it's a very interesting collection of uh, ideas. Now, when I personally try to imagine the future, I think it's very, very difficult to imagine what it would mean to give up on, on your individuality uh, in this way and serve uh, as part of a larger organism. I'm not saying that, that uh, such a future is impossible or even unlikely. I'm just saying that uh, it's uh, it's very difficult to to imagine it uh, on a, on a level where I can make up my mind on whether this is a desirable way to go yeah. or not. No, no. And uh, and, and uh, sorry. Hmm? Yeah, if you watched uh, Star Trek, uh, they have this uh, uh, Borg uh, society, which is uh, perceived as very very threatening, which uh, which uh, is this kind of uh, collective consciousness that, that wants to absorb or all other societies. And, and uh, in Star Trek, that is depicted as uh, something very, very threatening and uh, dangerous. But I don't want to rule out the, the possibility that maybe this will be our nirvana or something. Yes. And, and that, but I, and I, I obviously want to pick part of it. I'm not saying we should have give up all our individual uh, characteristics and so on, but at least having this, what's, what's positive with this and fantastic, inspiring to me is the way they communicate. So everyone knows, or it's sort of like having a software update continuously all the time. So if, if a bee discovers a new uh, source of, uh, of food, uh, of nectar, for example, a place, uh, a great, it will come back and it will dance and, and the level of intensity that the, the different bees have, the most intense it is, it is able to convince the other, others in the hive that this is the best way, the best source, the biggest uh, 
uh, source of nectar and everyone will know this they're sort of updated to, to update 1.1 <laughs> and everyone knows that this is the best place to go uh, so in that way it's sort of fantastic i think uh, and it's uh, uh, maybe that kind of uh, information exchange uh, could be the future if you think about Neuralink and so on if you think about this that perhaps we could mm. uh, have an you know a mail each morning updated with the new information that everybody else gets as well. Um, that's <laughs> I think this uh, this insect analogy, the bee analogy, is very fascinating, and, and uh, I've long been intrigued by this idea that asking what it's like to be uh, a bee is maybe the wrong question. Yeah, that it's a more relevant question to ask: What is it like to be this society of of bees? Yes, suggesting that. Uh, uh, to achieve intelligence uh, uh, and uh, even consciousness doesn't necessarily require physical connectedness. You can have a, a coherent system giving rise to consciousness without being uh, physically uh, constrained to a small space like uh, our skulls, but mm. can even be yeah. disconnected like a swarm of bees. Yeah. I, I think that's a really cool idea. I don't know what we can do with it, but uh, it's uh, it's something yeah. worth uh, yeah. pursuing further. I throw it out there. Perhaps someone else picks it up and knows something about it. It's all about sharing information and 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 uh, experience and knowledge and and inspiration. That's all evolution show is all about. And and this moves us naturally to the next question. I would like to ask: How do we educate people to prepare for a future with more advanced AI that could potentially hurt us, potentially be an existential threat, even? Uh, and how do we, yeah, how do we communicate this and make people understand this? Uh, in terms of education, it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, in school, it could also be people already are adults, of course. So, yeah, do you have an idea? <laughs> yes. So I, I, I think we have to proceed on many fronts. And one of them is people like you and me talking about this issue in podcasts and, uh, and so on. Uh, and... Uh, uh, I, I sometimes uh, give uh, uh, guest uh, lectures uh, at uh, high schools and so on. It's uh, one of the most uh, fun and rewarding uh, parts uh, of my work. And I think it's uh, very, very important to get through uh, to the young uh, generation. And uh, I have been uh, taking part uh, uh, a little bit in recent years in uh, teacher education, uh, which is a more indirect way of, of, of uh, getting through to the, um, uh, to the young generation. Uh, in general, I think that we have to, we have to, I mean, we are very few who are experts and enthusiasts uh, in this field. Uh, and that means uh, that in order to scale up the way in which we read to reach broader audiences. Uh, we have to rely on uh, indirect uh, ways mm. uh, of, of, of getting the message through. Mm. So this is a community which takes uh, the uh, idea of, of charity very seriously, and in particular, the idea of doing the best we can via charity. So we don't... Uh, doesn't suffice to donate to any old charity organization, but to, to uh, donate to the organization which does the most best. And therefore, uh, the, uh, they have these uh, lists of effective organizations. There's this website uh, called um, GiveWell that suggests uh, organizations to donate to and, and uh, uh, anti-malaria organizations are typically very high on this list. And, and uh, so they are doing very good things in practice, but they are also very good at theorizing about how to improve the world as efficiently as possible. And uh, they have identified AI safety and AI alignment as fields where if you have a limited amount of resources, the expected amount of good you can do uh, with them is among the best in, in uh, this particular field because uh, it has such an enormous effect, not just on people living now, but all future generations. 
which are potentially very, very many. Yeah. Uh, so if you calculate the number of possible human lives that can be affected by uh, a, a positive advance in uh, AI alignment, mm. I mean, that's, that's totally enormous. Yeah. So uh, the effective altruism community ha has uh, uh, increasingly focused on this uh, type of problem. Relatedly, they are also interested in, in bio-risk and how to uh, ways to prevent uh, the next uh, pandemic mm. uh, and so on. Uh, and uh, a part of this community is also an organization called 80,000 Hours, uh, which is kind of a, a consulting uh, thing where uh, young people can turn to them and ask them, I want to um, make the world uh, as good as possible, I, I want to do uh, an, as, uh, an as efficient part as possible of con contributing uh, to this thing. And I have these and these skills and these and these interests. And how, how can I best employ my capabilities in the project mm. of making the world better? And they will have suggestions individually uh, adapted to, to the, the particular uh, person. And uh, it's, I mean, globally uh, speaking, this is still uh, a fairly small movement, but it's uh, increasing uh, quite rapidly and I see their potential. Okay, let's uh, just finish up with, uh, I mean, when you think about this super AI and artificial general intelligence, uh, I can't but help to think about the climate crisis. We, we talked about it uh, in the previous episode that um, it might be at least as big of a problem, a, a challenge for the future as um, uh, climate crisis is today, uh, the AI superintelligence or artificial general intelligence, or even a step back, uh, our uh, transition today towards artificial general intelligence might create problems that are huge for humanity if we don't think about AI safety. So. But if we think about the positive side, just for people to understand that we have a potential to do this right, um, couldn't it be that we could actually address the climate crisis uh, thanks to new AI tools if we develop them uh, in this safe way that we want? Yes, absolutely. And, and the abstract way to think about this is that uh, humans uh, presently control the planet in a way that wasn't the case 100,000 years ago. 100,000 years ago, we were, were more like just another uh, species, not particularly uh, physically capable or anything. And since then, we've taken over the world. And this has nothing to do with our muscular strength or our physical endurance and so on. And it has everything to do with our intelligence. So intelligence is this enormously powerful tool to uh, for using which uh, we can uh, achieve, I mean, basically anything. So if we can now automate intelligence and, and create uh, machines that uh, maybe even exceed our own uh, intelligence, uh, they already do that in, in, in their domains. But, but, uh, and uh, there is this, issue we've been talking about, whether they can, can do it more generally, but regardless of that, putting uh, artificial intelligence uh, at work uh, to, towards uh, whatever goal we have uh, is likely to, in the long run, uh, produce uh, uh, big effects. And uh, if we put it to work towards uh, the right goals, and I think sustainability and managing the climate uh, and so on are among these most important goals, then, then the potential for AI to be helpful here is just uh, unlimited. Yeah, I think that there's a great way to finish off this discussion uh, because I want people to, to leave with a positive uh, note and understand, be inspired and also know that there's still hope. It's very important for people to still have hope, but it's... Oh, yeah. Yes, and, and I think Ole uh, has really, you really put this quite clear and in your book. Um, 
thinking machines. If people would like to learn more about your research and uh, perhaps your books and uh, so on, uh, is there any way to contact you? Well, yes. I mean, uh, you can Google my name and you will find my email address. You can check out my blog, Hegström Hevdar. The title of the blog is, uh, is in Swedish, but uh, I, I vary between uh, Swedish and uh, English language uh, uh, blog posts. Uh, I have some presence uh, on Twitter and so on and so forth. So, so there are a number of ways. Yeah, great. Again, Ole, thank you for this conversation. I hope people enjoy this as much as I did and are inspired to take this problem serious and do something great about it. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be on the show. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you like the content and you want to support the show, we really appreciate a thumbs up and consider subscribing. As always, stay ahead of the curve and stay electric. Next week, we'll be back with another inspiring guest. I hope to see you then.